So here's our third lecture in the genetics series that we've been covering. Uh, this lecture is going to be over chromosomes, how we can map the chromosomes and actually discover where certain genes are located, and then the meiosis side of it and how it connects to inheritance, taking a look at how a certain piece of DNA on a chromosome will pass to an offspring and what that potentially means for the offspring. Okay, so as we explore this chapter and this uh, information, we want to revisit Mendel briefly. So chromosomal theory of inheritance. It's not a guess. We know because it's theory. We know how inheritance passes from parent to offspring. That's the idea behind theory. It's something that's based in fact. And genetically, we know pieces of DNA get passed from mom, pieces from dad. Those combine, they go to the child, the child inherits those genetics. So Mendel helped establish some of these foundations back in 1865 when he presented. Unfortunately, he was ignored um, when he presented to the Linnaean Society. He continued his work, but it wasn't until the early 1900s when different researchers revisited Mendel's work. They all came to the same conclusion independently of each other and independent of Mendel's work. So you have a multitude of researchers coming up with the same concepts, the same conclusions, without collaboration. It shows strength for those ideas. And this is when we say genetics was officially born as a field of science in the early 1900s. And we've continued to grow in our knowledge since then. Something to keep in mind, we still have only scratched the surface of genetics. There is a just a fantastic or phenomenal amount of information out there about genetics that we still have yet to learn. So expect things to constantly be changing and updating and new information, especially as technologies continue to advance and develop. So here's an early researcher that we want to note. T.H. Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan. Back in 1910, he was discovering mutations in fruit flies. He was studying the fruit flies and finding out that not all of them have the same variations and the same traits. So the main ones he discovered that we're looking at here are these eye colors. Red eyes are normal in fruit flies. That's the normal, what's called the wild type eye color. So there's an allele for that. But Hunt came across fruit flies, or Morgan came across fruit flies with white eyes. Well, how does that happen? What's the gene or the genetic reason for that? So the top right picture here, we have two fruit flies mating. And when Morgan was doing his research, he would mate fruit flies. And he discovered that sometimes their offspring were red-eyed, which was normal. Other times they were white-eyed which was not normal. That's the mutant or the mutation. So what he was focusing on, red eyes versus white eyes. Why does this variation of white show up? And then what are the genes behind it? So Morgan discovered the association with what we call sex linkage traits. These are traits that are specifically found on the X chromosome. Okay, so they're only found on the X chromosome of the 23rd pair. So when we're looking at chromosomes, sex linkage is very, very specific to that X chromosome. So we're not worried about chromosome pair 1, 2, 3, 4, any of those. In humans, we would focus on chromosomal pair 23. This is the one that determines your gender. So we can fill in the blank here. Sex-linked traits are associated with the X chromosome. That is critical for understanding how these problems work. Okay, so when you're looking at parents and looking at genetics and looking at alleles and what you're going to pass to your children, when we focus on the sex linkage, the X chromosome from mom goes to a child, but with dad, dad can pass either an X or a Y chromosome. That's what makes sex linkage special. So if you're concerned about being bald, if you're a male, 
you want to look at your mother's side of the family tree and focus on your grandfather. That's how we want to focus on or look at sex linkage. So we'll talk more about those scenarios in a bit here. But as a human, we have 46 chromosomes, or we will say 23 pairs of chromosomes. Pairs 1 through 22 are called the autosomes. These are the chromosomes that determine eye color, hair color, height, weight, susceptibility to cancer, diabetes, etc., 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 all those basic genetics about humans. Those pairs are identical. Moms, dads, everybody's going to have the same basic 22 pairs. The 23rd pair, or one pair of chromosomes in our genetic makeup, are what we call the sex chromosomes. Females, XX. Males, XY. That's what makes us different when we talk about gender. So females will have two of these big X chromosomes you see up at the top here. They're going to have two of these. Males, 1X, and a Y chromosome. Okay, so it's a huge, huge concept to make sure you guys lock in on. Females, X, X. Males, X, and Y. All right, now as we approach sex link scenarios, the trait, the variation, the allele for sex linkage is associated with only the X chromosome. So this means X's will carry an allele, but the Y chromosomes do not. So moms, any mom out there, could have X with a little a big A attached to it. X with another big A, maybe it's X with big A and X little a, or the other possibility is X little a, little a. Just depends on the genetics of mom. Dads though, X big A, Y. That's it. Or X little a, Y. And that's it. We don't put any type of allele on the Y chromosome. So that influences how sex link traits are passed to our children. And so sex chromosomes vary among species. In humans, we have X's and Y's, males and females. In birds, we have ZW's and ZZ's. In grasshoppers, XX and XO. Honeybees, now we're getting into a whole weird, goofy situation here. We have diploid females, haploid males, because the males don't carry the full amount of genetics. They're sterile, they're the workers, etc. So a lot of variation in the sex chromosomes when we look across different species. Our primary focus, though, is looking at what's going on with humans. Okay, we're going to focus there, but I definitely encourage you guys, think about how this can differ across different species and just how does that play a role in producing variation among the offspring. Okay, So definitely one of those areas of genetics where there's a lot of opportunity for future research. As I mentioned earlier, we've really only scratched the surface of this. So with sex link disorders, when we look at traits that are associated with the sex chromosomes, they're far more likely to impact males than females. It, females can have color blindness. Females can have hemophilia. Baldness is a sex link trait. Muscular dystrophy. There's a variety of other traits out there that are associated with sex linkage. But by and large, it's males who are affected. The reason for that is most of the sex linked disorders, or what we call X linked disorders, they're due to recessive alleles. So recessive, that's the key with this stuff. If you're recessive, oh, there we go. If you're recessive, you need little a's to express. That's how you show up recessive. Now, if you have two X chromosomes, you need two little a's. So females have to have two little a's to be recessive for hemophilia, for color blindness. So one little a on each of their X chromosomes. The odds of that happening are not so good. 
It does happen, but it's just not as likely. But with males, since guys, we only have one X chromosome, we only need one little a. So if we get that little a on our X, our Y says you're a male, determines your gender, then you express that sex link trait. So this is why when we look at family trees and we look at who's possibly going to have these traits, most of the time men are the ones expressing it. Men express it, but in order for a man to get it, his mother had to either have the trait or carry the trait and pass that on to the son. Okay, so here's a simple colorblind test. If you can look at this and read the number 24, you can distinguish red and green. Every semester when I show this slide, I will have one, if not two, students per class who raise their hand and say, I can't see that. They're always guys. Every semester, it's always been a guy who could not read that because they can't distinguish red from green. Now, there is a big spectrum of color blindness. Sometimes it's you can't distinguish shades of the color versus just complete differentiation between red versus green. So, again, a big spectrum here. But what we're going to look at here with the sex linkage is you know, dad is unaffected. We say normal. He does not have the allele for color blindness. Mom, she can see color. But she's a carrier, meaning she carries that piece of DNA for colorblindness on one of her X chromosomes. Now, if you set up the Punnett square and draw out, okay, what are the odds that so-and-so inherited this? I'm going to go back to those little vi that video I did over sex linkage. Then you're saying, okay, here's normal dad. Here's a carrier mom. Dad's normal X. Mom's normal X. You got your daughter who's unaffected. Dad's normal X, mom's affected X with the colorblind allele. You have your carrier daughter. But now if you take dad's Y and mom's normal X, you have a son who is unaffected and normal. But if you take dad's Y and mom's X that has the allele for colorblindness, now your son is affected. So if this couple had four children, we would expect one of the sons to be normal, he can see color. One of the sons to be colorblind, he cannot see color. The girls, both girls can see color. One of them, though, is a carrier for this variation. She's a carrier for colorblindness, but it doesn't influence her ability to see color. She just carries a recessive allele. So... Sex linkage plays out very differently than the other genetic scenarios we've been talking about because of how we work with the X's and the Y chromosomes. So the classic example of sex linkage is hemophilia in the royal family. We have Prince Albert and Queen Victoria. Now, Queen Victoria, turns out, was a carrier for this. She didn't realize it. Her and Prince Albert started having children. They had a lot. They had nine kids. And they had boys and they had girls. And it turns out her son, Leopold, was a hemophiliac. They didn't realize it came from mom at that time. It took a while to get this sorted out and figured out that something must have passed from mom to Leopold. Now, her other son, Arthur, Alfred, um, King Edward, the seventh, etc. Those guys were all okay. They didn't have any hemophilia. It was Leopold who inherited that small X from his mother. Her daughter Alice and Beatrice, both those girls turned out to be carriers. They then passed it down to the next generation. So if you look at on the far right here, Beatrice was a carrier. She married Prince Henry, and it turns out two of their sons were hemophiliacs. The third one dodged it. He didn't get it. But two of them got it. And their daughter, Queen Eugenie, she was a carrier. So when Queen Eugenie and King the Alfonso, the King of Spain, had children, two of their sons became hemophiliacs. Two of them dodged it. And you look and go, okay, 
this is a sex link issue. 